Where is your hands? Second you student. Know. Any? No, good. <laughs> <laughs> Third year students. Third year students. Uh, where's Pavina? Uh, she's she's here. She's here. She. Uh, although it's said. Fourth year students. Mm -hmm. Fifth year students. Very nice. And uh, sixth year students. Seems that someone is missing. This is not sixty students, but anyway. Okay, PhD students. One, two, three. Seems to have more. <laughs> Let's, let's say that we have four, at least. Uh, so our today's speaker is uh, Vlad Shakur, who calls himself Shakuri, according to your email address. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> ten years old. Yeah. Anyway, I'm you're still because, using this. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it goes quite funny. <laughs> so Vlad is working with a uh, friendly group, uh, Bioton Conversion. Uh, so his today presentation will be about his uh, joint work with Sebastian Navozin during his stay in, in, in Cambridge, right? Yeah, during the summer. It will be not really about my work, but uh, about a large volume of previous work. Okay. Yeah. Okay, but uh, this one of previous work is somehow related to yeah. what you are doing now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, so, as it was advertised, my talk is about generative neural networks. And uh, how many of you are familiar with generative adversarial networks? Please raise your hands. Okay, let's see everyone. Well, that's good. So, uh, <laughs> I will assume that you are familiar with generate better serial networks and we're going to uh, discuss how they work. And um, my talk will, will be about an alternative way to train generate neural, neural networks, which is not as popular as better serial networks. And it will be divided in roughly two parts. The first, in the first part, I will describe loss function and show how it can be applied to unconditional, uh, for instance, image generating. So, given some random noise, we'd like our neural network to squash it somehow and get some mist like image and stuff like that. And in the second part of the talk, I will talk about <coughs> using um, that loss function for training uh, neural networks that can give some meaningful predictions. So, for instance, given an image, uh, we'd like to get some structural, structural output. Okay, so the first part is about how would you train a neural network uh, to generate images. Okay, so um, let's start with uh, definition of our problem. Uh, for instance, we have some NIST images and we want to train our neural network to generate uh, images which look like NIST images. So we assume that we have two random variables, uh, x and y, with two distribution functions, p and q, and we have observations on these uh, random variables and we'd like to decide if p is equal q. So what does it mean? We have some real data, we have some neural network and we'd like to know if our neural network generates uh, images that are similar to real images. 
and we'd like to measure it somehow. Okay. We'll uh, introduce high level loss function. It is called maximum mean discrepancy. Well, it is actually from uh, statistical hypothesis testing, and it is uh, defined as for some space of functions. We'd like to compute mean value of function on samples from one distribution and to compute uh, the same value on samples from Q distribution. After that, we get supremum uh, and we uh, take every function from such function space. So now it is pretty useless for us, but how make it more practical? Well, the first step is let's consider not uh, any uh, space of functions, but uh, reproducing kernel Hilbert space uh, H, and we will consider a unit ball in that space which has some associated kernel. So uh, you are familiar with this VM, and it is pre uh, the same space that is used for kernel brick. Okay, and in that unit ball, <laughs> in uh, each uh, m of d is zero if and only if p is equal to q. Excuse me, is it, is it true for, for furniture of kernel? Uh, yeah. You sure? For any uh, RKHS H. Yes, but RKHS uh, is, uh, is fully defined by kernel function. Yeah. And for any shares of kernel function, if m of d is zero, uh, even and if p equals q. Yeah. So this means that if p equals q, then, oh, oh, okay, then uh, in any RK, RKHS, uh, mmd will be equal to zero. But if we find at least one table space with a producing kernel where mmd is zero, then we can be sure that uh, p equals q. Yep. OK, and now could you tell a few words about uh, RKHS? What is this? How we can parameterize? Functions from this uh, space because I think that uh, many in the audience they just do not they're not familiar with their reproducing kernel table space. Well, the um, the definition is pretty high level, and I will not well uh, informally at least informally not informally uh, um, a reproducing uh, kernel table space is the thing that. It is a space of functions, uh, and for okay, for any two functions, f and g, which uh, are from that space, we can see. Sorry, we can see this one. <laughs> Can you see that one? It's it's okay in the okay. size. It's simply the, uh, the green one is not Okay. So if H is RKHS, then uh, if we take scalar product on F and G, uh, it is small uh, if and only if F of X minus G of X is small. Or any x. Uh, uh, no, but this is even not true. Okay. Why is it so? Sorry. 
if in a product with uh, f and g is small, this means that uh, those two functions are almost orthogonal. It doesn't mean that they should be equal. Oh, then the norm. Yeah. Maybe the norm. Mm -hmm. Normal <coughs> small if well, if yeah. Well, but sorry, but <laughs> this is almost trivial. <laughs> <laughs> I do not think that this is a distinctive property of the reducing kernel of public space. <laughs> and, and the most important, where is kernel up here? Oh, it should be somewhere. But yeah, it's. Uh, how can you just define the FHS of the kernel game? <coughs> just a set of uh, partial applications of that kernel. Yeah, okay, so we can uh, use a kernel uh, to compute scalar, scalar products and stuff like that. But uh, the uh, high level definition of FKHS in, is not on the top of my talk. Anyway, you, you mentioned this theorem. That's important. Yeah, but we will use uh, in the second, in the next slide to uh, strip uh, away that space and work with more uh, simple things. Okay, I don't do you remember uh, the definition of RGHS? At least in formal definition. Because uh, okay. I, I don't remember. I well, try it. I don't know but I'm not sure. It's something that any element from this uh, table space can be represented as a linear combination of, of, of some. Uh, this is the Where's the eraser? It's over there. So the space H is actually just a set of functions. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Some space, some space x. X is functions or, or what? Uh, x is uh, our uh, objects, our observations, uh, the set of all possible observations you could have. Yeah, it, it actually usually it's usually some um, subset of our n for some n. So the RKHS is just a space of functions. Uh, this is a function of. Uh, what about the linear combinations? Uh, they should be also a part of. The uh, well, yeah, it's a span of it. Yes. yes. So. Uh, let's see. This. So the reproducing property is that of if you have some function f from that space, and you take a scalar product with some kernel, maybe not even the, uh, maybe this space is actually known to be dense in some some standard functional space like L2 probably. Uh, so if you take some function and you take a scalar product of that thing, you actually get uh, the realization of that function at that point. Uh, is it the same kernel? Uh, this is just some function. From, H. from A and from this kernel space, which is uh, <laughs> right from, uh, which is defined by this kernel, okay. right? Yes. So F is also G of something. Uh, yes. And Y. Uh, no, no but not, if, not exactly. Maybe. Right? Yeah, it could be a linear combination. Okay, but okay. Well, there won't be X, and there will be like some other reflection, right? Okay. In the right hand side. Uh, uh, yeah, F. Uh, they could not be X say that F is equal to What is F of X? Well, uh, it's like, uh, so this is function, this, uh, this function is a scalar product, so the result is a scalar, and uh, this is a scalar. 
Do you understand right that uh, standard L2 space is uh, in some sense like a RKHS with the delta function as a camera? Uh, because this property uh, looks pretty much the same as the property of delta function. Yes. Mm -hmm. The scale, scale product uh, in functional space is simply integral of the product, right? Mm -hmm. It's uh, mm -hmm. RKHS mm -hmm. because basically this property that which was written first, it says that if you change, I mean, okay, what's wrong with the integral? You can change one point in the function and the integral won't change. But the norm will change. Uh, I mean, no, the, norm the, norm will change. Uh, yeah, the norm will not change, but uh, the difference between the functions will change. Uh, well, so it, it, it will be small for some, for some uh, of Yes, yeah, so right. basically, uh, if you, your norm defined that as L2, it's not RPGs. Okay, this is why I, I told in some sense. Okay. <laughs> so the uh, kernel plays, uh, the kernel for this for the space plays the same role as the delta function plays for L2 space. In this case, mixed for the set. K is fixed for double space. Just the double space H is fully defined by kernel. Now, this is in some sense reasonable. Although the theory of our evaluation of space was popular some years ago when the support of machines were popular, now it's not because we are using different methods. <laughs> but anyway, so let, 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 let us continue on. Any questions? I don't understand anything. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a question, it's a statement. <laughs> No, actually, I have a question. Why, uh, let's say that f uh, is equal to k point x, like the same thing as the right part of the uh, a scalar product, mm -hmm. and then we say that like scalar product of one function, and, uh, and I don't understand what it does mean. Like you, you, even can you, if you p square equal to k y here, yes, then because uh, the dot product is uh, symmetrical, then you have so right hand side depends on the on x and left hand side on y and x symmetrically. It's strange. I don't understand what But this is exactly the key of uh, x, y. Yes. So what's your oh, okay. okay. And this is the answer to your question as well. So the Can result of this scalar product is this function you like that. If this function is partial application of your ah, Okay, okay. Any other questions? Well, conceptually, it's it's not difficult. Conceptually, the difficulties are theoretical properties, but the concept is uh, more or less clear. So we fix kernel function that is uh, positively definite uh, function of two arguments. Then we say that uh, any linear combination of any number of kernel functions with a fixed uh, second argument is an element from this sort of infinite linear combination. Or at least countable linear combination, but maybe the continuum of linear combinations is still an element from from Hilbert space. And uh, this property, with scalar product, pro probably it can be proven directly from uh, from definition of this Hilbert space, but I'm not sure. But uh, this property uh, well, states that uh, in some sense, kernel uh, function for this Hilbert space is a, uh, is an analog of delta function for Standard L2 space, which we all know. Okay, now let us uh, hold back to this theorem. <laughs> so, let's see the final one. Oh. Okay. That's a human spirit. Let's simplify now. Uh, we have a kernel associated with uh, that space, and we can substitute that supremum on unit ball uh, <coughs> of 
functions f with so the, uh, the first question here, what is unit ball in this Hilbert space? Because mm -hmm. that's that's important. The unit ball is uh, you can see. Well, if you have a scalar product, then this is uh, norm. <coughs> and it's in this metric. <coughs> so uh, what is the norm in this uh, RKHS? <coughs> How is it defined? Uh, it uses scalar products. Please proceed. <laughs> so we need to define in the product between yeah. two elements of this kind of space. Can I ask one Sorry. more stupid question? Yeah. Yeah. Let us consider such a simple right. case. Uh, let us consider two elements from kernel space, uh, which both are finite combinations of kernel functions. So this is L of x, this is g of x. Beta J, J, X. Why do you write two arguments? Like you have a function on the left and uh, yes. a number on the right. Uh, well, why function. number? This is the function of, of function of X. Oh, okay. You have X comma X side. Okay. So now we know that uh scale product between any element and any <coughs> <laughs> right. um, and you care about the fixed second argument is f of y, right? According to this property. So now we need to, to uh, define what is this. So this is exactly a scalar product between f and, and g. And now by using the linear property, you may say that this is, for example, summation with respect to j, theta j, of what? Here's f of x, actually. And here's simply t of x, <coughs> y, j. Right? And this is exactly. something like this YG. No, this is quite strange yeah. <laughs> why we can see it. If it is just a quadratic form alpha uh, transpose times okay, okay. matrix K let me decompose it Maybe not, it's not so bad. So here's some way with respect to i. <coughs> k, k of what? X i, x j. Y, j, x, j. Right? Mm -hmm. But kernel is actually symmetric, so I have a speech arguments. Whatever. And then I, I end up with a double summation with respect to i, j. Alpha i, d, j. <coughs> K of something that would be XI, YG. And this seems to be quite pretty. So I will say that I would believe <laughs> such such uh, expression as an answer for, for in a product. And, and, and of course, the same situation is uh, for the case when, when uh, these Linear combination consists of uh, 
infinite number or continuum number of elements. Everything is pretty much the same except that uh, this summation just to into, into integration. So this is uh, scalar product in this field of space, right? So double summation, okay, then double summation. In some sense, we can we can uh, think of these elements of perfect space as a uh, decomposition with respect to some basis, but this basis consists of continuum number of elements. So we have and so on, where this axis are actually uh, this continuum number of such basis functions. And then uh, each element of the space can be decomposed with respect to this basis. This example is where uh, decomposition is fine. So only finite number of uh, elements in our decomposition is different from zero, or others are zero. But this would be f of x. Okay, and then um, this matrix is something like gram matrix. So we have uh, two elements from our vector space uh, with these coefficients of the composition respect to basis. Then we simply, when we try to, to compute inner product, we do something like this. Well, it's actually exactly in the gram matrix if you write it uh, as a matrix. Because, you know, the kernel trick is actually introduced as uh, you take some. Uh, scalar product, and you replace uh, it with, the, with some kernel, and it's exactly uh, the result is exactly as if you in the first place replace your features with some expanded representation in uh, high level in high dimensional space. Yes, I know. So this is <laughs> like gram matrix. This is exactly exactly gram matrix for some uh, well, space. For the case where when the decomposition is finite, yes. In general case, there would be double integration, there will be camera function here, so there will be uh, continuum analog of gram matrix. But for the continuum case. Okay, so we have defined this scalar product, and now what is unit ball? Again. <laughs> so this is a set of functions. That works such that its norm with respect to this Hilbert space is less or equal than one. Right? Yeah. So this means that f of x times f of x is less or equal than one. Uh, again, if we use this final decomposition, then uh, what will we get? So this is summation with respect to IJ, alpha I, alpha J, K, X, I, X, J, <coughs> right? It should be less or equal than 1. <coughs> and we have to, to consider all such functions. So it should be so continual functions here. So the theorem is, sounds quite nice, but it's, I guess, extremely difficult to check whether it falls through or not for a particular MMD. Because probably we, we can't uh, describe all, all functions that have unit norm, uh, even for, for a particular uh, producer camera for this case. Hmm. Yes. Can I ask a stupid question? Mm -hmm. Can you explain please, uh, <coughs> once more why uh, the scalar product of f and uh, k equal to f of x? That's yeah, or is it the defi definition? Yeah. Yeah? I'd say it's the definition. So <laughs> it's like literally you said that uh, k of point and x is like the basis functions, and uh, this is simply. Uh, Okay. 
Yes. Could you repeat uh, a little bit louder? What sense has the functional E? Could you repeat this? Is it an uh, E? Yes. Uh, it is uh, expectation. Expectation, yes? Yeah. With respect to the It is a general proper space, yes? Yeah. So it is an expectation uh, on samples from distribution P and F of X. Uh, X is a sample or random variable uh, from a uh, web distribution. Okay. So then we take uh, the supremum and on functions from unit ball. And given that we have a kernel, which can be, uh, uh, which is by definition uh, in a product with uh, some feature mapping. Uh, that Suprema can be replaced uh, with norm in that space uh, with regard, uh, so instead of all Fs, uh, we get phi, which is a feature uh, transformation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are they actually get rid of Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very supreme. And the thing for uh, must be by definition of no. Uh, but after that's all, I'm not really sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So now for. Uh, we will use squared and on D. Uh, and if we uh, open the brackets of the norm, we will get that uh, equation. So uh, with inner products of F of fees, and we can substitute that inner products with our kernel. So it is a simplified equation for m d squared. Excuse me, haven't you missed two in the, the second item? Yes. Do <laughs> uh, uh, they understand why the uh, norm is uh, like supremo in the previous slide? <laughs> no. <laughs> what is the thing? Huh? What is the thing? Uh, is a feature mapping, uh, which is... Which um, is unique for kernel. Oh, okay. So some kernels can be can be defined as as poles. Like mm -hmm. any kernel can be defined as poles. Mm -hmm. It's like a definition, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. It may be like not. Uh, mm -hmm. No, right this is a for now. For now, the most important question is where is the problem? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any hypothesis? <laughs> Maybe you're like, it shouldn't be here? No? No. Okay. You know, what would that be true if you don't have some expectations, but you have some, you know, functions? It's just like f of x, uh, f minus j. Mm -hmm. F minus so if you get rid of expectations and have this, the same kind of formula with like supremum equals something without supremum. Mm -hmm. So you mean that uh, <coughs> total expectation here? Yeah. Like, <coughs> um, for example, if I need some specific point. Mm -hmm. Well, 
maybe yes, but it must somehow uh, use P and Q distributions. Why? Uh, because we want to... Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, I just trying to understand the equals, not regardless of the neural networks and stuff. Okay. So if you can get rid of the application, Mm. So you think that the expectations do not work here? But X is a random variable. Random variable. Variable. So this is the initial point, and uh, our next point is, uh, uh, is the first equation here. We do not have some problem. So the hypothesis is that the parameters can be attained at phi. And what? Uh, it's a chain at, at phi. If you take f equals phi, the phi from the kernel decomposition, mm -hmm. then maybe you actually get the yes. Mark. This is the idea, mark. but we need we need to derive it. So we need to substitute. Substitute what? Well, because uh, on one hand you have an expectation of f. On the other hand, you have expectation of phi. They are somehow related. So our friend suggests, and probably he's all right, that the supremum with respect to f equals phi. That equals phi. Maybe it's phi. Yes, it's a The question is whether we can prove it or not. Okay, let us let for now let us simply believe that this is so. Okay. This so how we define phi strictly? Uh, phi is a feature mapping. Uh, so uh, phi is a feature mapping that uniquely corresponds to kernel and to the space. In other words, any kernel function can always be decomposed as yeah. follows. Where well, phi is some function. In many cases, it's not clear how to define this function phi, but uh, theory claims that uh, we can always do this. But isn't it always true for any function from this kernel to the base? What? That uh, for any phi, phi of x, and phi of y, that product is here for y. Yes, but uh, this this scale of xi uh, uh, can, can, can define different purpose space. You mean here we have k, which is not the same as the computer space for you? No, it's the same. Then no, probably it would understand the question. I mean, so this is the identity on the top is true for any function phi from the computer space. Well, actually, why here is a better function. So, first point is that uh, I'm wrong, and uh, we cannot. Um, uh, on the previous slide, f was scalar function, and mm -hmm. y is not a scalar function. So, a uh, different function. Mm -hmm. uh, and to your uh, question, Sasha, phi is a better function. So, so it's, it's a different kind of uh, Yes. It induces kernel. For kernel, there is, I guess, only one uniquely defined by function. It can be either finite, finite, or infinite. Mm -hmm. Can you like go back for one second? <laughs> I'm trying to. Okay, let us continue. So let us assume that uh, uh, for each choice of Hilbert space, which is defined by a uh, corresponding kernel, then we claim that uh, supremum of M of G is attained when F equals to pi, which is... <coughs> how can it equal pi? F is scalar, phi is vector, right? Mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. I think this is uh, some kind of Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. When you maximize well, a linear form in a unit ball, 
you get uh, a dual norm uh, of the second argument. Mm -hmm. so if, if you maximize uh, a linear function, let's say s dot product x on the unit ball x less uh, than one, you get um, the norm of s. Mm -hmm. So I think this is it. There is all that text and user at market. No, uh, some linear combination that like that like so comma k x mm. and uh, some elements. No, this is not definition. The definition was a linear combination of kernel functions. This is not. It's not. Very mm. linear combination. F and uh, K. Yes. Right. Yeah, this is just a nice combination of partial like without any No, no, the definition. Yeah. The definition so, of K was that uh, F of X equals uh, uh, yes. X. This is the This Um. <coughs> This inner product is actually an inner product with some particular phi of phi and uh, uh, what? Yes, but we say that uh, we start with a feedback space, which is a feedback uh, which is a space of functions. And uh, this feedback space has an inner product on it. And uh, If we consider a linear function, then any linear function can be represented as a linear product. Uh, and here we have one to one correspondence uh, with uh, k corresponds to f of s. Don't we need now to change k, yeah. to change k into 
I'm out of the other between B. Yes, I think so. so. What? A. Okay. Oh, that's water. I mean, uh, with respect to what do you have expectation? I mean, P is distribution of this or S or what? Or X. What is or X. X. Yeah, yeah. So F is doesn't depend on yes. X. So, so we actually, can uh, uh, rewrite the whole under the expression under Cyprian yes. as that rather between F and the difference of the expectations. Yes. Mm -hmm. And how do we? And how do we this is it? And how do we have this expectation? Like the additional of kernel, which one? Then, I guess you have to repeat. I mean, you can get the linear function you see. And you fix the second here. argument, and this is a function of the first argument. Yeah. And this is exactly an expectation <coughs> of phi. Which is written here. Because kernel function can be represented as, as a product of phi of y, phi of x. Then we can move phi of x out of this expectation. Since we can get expectation with respect to the first argument, say y. And then we obtain phi of x uh, transpose times uh, expectation phi of y. Expectation with respect to p of y. So it's a dot. Phi mm -hmm. of y. Uh, so expectation. Phi of x. Yes? No. no this x is fixed here. And the variable is first argument. And the distribution p is defined with respect to the first argument. Yes. Like this. Mm. Something like this. No. Um. Can you we're almost done. Can you explain one more time why expectation respect to P of K equal to this style product? <coughs> So we have got rid of x of square. Yes. Now we need to get rid of uh, and then, and then the normal this function is exactly again by Cauchy Schwarz. 
again, this is just this. Uh, why? If uh, we only need to check that uh, the norm of this is less than one. But why? <coughs> why should it be less than less one? Equal. <coughs> I mean, we don't have a problem here, so. <coughs> hmm. Actually, there are both uh, square, no? mm -hmm. maybe this way. Yeah, but uh, it doesn't matter. We just need to, to take square here, here, and here, and here. Yeah, the MMD was also squared, so yes. the MMD not squared should be just a norm. Well, we need to prove that this is less than one. But this well, is less equal to one. Maybe just don't equal care about one. one. Equal to one, more or less. We don't have to here. Okay. Okay. This is a constant. I mean, the MMD doesn't care about it because it measures the distance between P and Q. Uh, but how can I do not understand why we can uh, represent this inner product as a. There should be an equality. Why is the equality? Why, why is equality here? Inner product, and you remove it with a product of two norms. Yeah. This is not true in general case. So I have to justify it, but I suggest not to do this because I have some doubts that um, this transition uh, bottom left was right. But anyway, I think that uh, the, the, the conceptual idea is, is now clear. So we, we understand how we can uh, get rid of this problem. And all others are all some, some technical details. So the idea is that uh, even though uh, our function, uh, even though functions phi, which define kernel k, then we can always uh, uh, count this supremum uh, explicitly as expectation of this uh, function phi. So please proceed. Uh, so, k must be two. And actually, we got. A much more tractable uh, equation and it can be estimated. <coughs> so, but this is a biased estimate, of, <coughs> can easily obtain unbiased. Um, but, uh, so, we just uh, take our samples and uh, compute uh, empirical estimations of expectations. So we, uh, instead of expectation, place sums on uh, summation uh, of uh, kernel values on samples. So here is an equation for practical use, which can be easily programmed. Mm -hmm. No, there, there was a restraint. <coughs> so here it's two, and here it must be two also actually. Okay, so this is a, a loss function which is ready now or to for plugging it into neural network training. So uh, our neural network will get as input some random noise, it is called Z. We have some, Z can be normal or uniform. Uh, in that uh, neural net, it is uniform from minus one to one. Uh, it gets Z noise as input, squashes it somehow, and as output of the neural net, we have some sample. And we have samples from data, and we can obtain uh, samples from neural net. So given training data set prior on Z and some neural nets with somehow randomly initialized weights, uh, we will train using uh, usual gradient descent. We get a mini batch of data. We generate samples from that neural net with any random z, so uh, 
Z uh, are not fixed here. So as we uh, proceed on this uh, next page, we generate new Z, uh, squash them, and generate new samples. After that, we can compute MMD on uh, data, sam uh, data samples and samples from our neural net. Uh, MMD is differentiable. So, so, so yeah. Can you give intuition about uh, why our objective is MMD? Why should, shouldn't we use scale divergence or something like that? What is the advantage of this approach? Which this kernel is do we use? It can be optimized. And we but know that it equals zero if and only if the distributions are the same. Mm. Which kernel do we use? Practice uh, <coughs> uh, more least, for example, I use the You have to uh, seek for parameters for sigma, mm -hmm. but Gaussian uh, mm -hmm. is Okay. So it is differentiable and we can use gradient descent to uh, is it clear how to train neural net? Um, is there a problem of cold start, like in uh, regular generated Versailles networks when they have discriminator, it's there is a high probability that discriminator will abuse uh, the imperfectness of generator and will not provide a, a, a sufficient gradient to learn to generate it. Is there some kind of cold start problem here? Uh, actually, no. So, uh, from my uh, experience, uh, I just uh, implemented it, uh, and from the first run, after checking that I implement loss function correctly, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Uh, after that, I uh, chose sigma equal one and float. So it's, uh, mm -hmm. the point of that uh, function is that it's, well, actually it is an adversary. So it is a measure of so how good is our neural net on uh, generating samples which are close to real data. Uh, well, adversarial neural networks uh, are maybe more powerful because here we have a fixed kernel. Of course, we can uh, change some parameters, but in adversarial networks, we have adversary which is trained specifically for the task. But this is state. exactly what we can do here. Uh, we can use an adversarial network that uh, will tune the parameter of our kernel function in such a way in order to maximize MMT. Yeah. So it tries to find uh, the worst kernel with respect to which yes. our two samples uh, are, di uh, are different at most. And then we, we yeah. use the first network yeah. in order to, to, to minimize MMT with respect to this new kernel. Yeah. So, this, uh, so I, ideologically, this is uh, pretty much the same thing. Yeah. The criteria are different. And that's quite interesting. Okay. So, uh, yeah. we are talking about the basic networks and what do you generate images? So, there will be an example. Usual Gaussian area kernel for images. Select comparison. Uh, so, uh, speaking about Gaussian, if we uh, switch here. Mm -hmm. If we uh, look at Gaussian channel and at phi, which corresponds to Gaussian channel, uh, the phi for Gaussian channel, channel will be an exponential uh, sequence. So actually, when we take here expectation of that phi and uh, compare that expectation with that one, we will uh, compare uh, different moments of our distributions with exponential weights. So uh, gradient descent will minimize 
uh, not in parallel, but jointly, uh, all moments, uh, all differences in moments of that these expectations with exponential weights. Yeah. Uh, if you, uh, for instance, take phi, which is phi of x, x will equal x, which is identity function, you will, be, you will uh, uh, generate samples which are which have some mean color, for instance, the same as the data set. And if you take exponential kernel, you look not only on the mean, but on the second, on the third moment, and to the infinity. Yeah, but I guess that applies to <coughs> any kernel that has uh, infinite amount of yeah. terms. Yeah. Uh, expansion. Maybe the weights you have uh, with those terms, maybe the weights matter. Maybe, yes. The weights are the parameters of this kernel, so yeah, we can draw it for example. It's actually interesting whether you can use some other kernel rather than the standard ones. Uh, the one that would be capturing the perceptual similarity of the images. Okay, <laughs> so there will be one uh, can be strictly called kernel, but you will see another example which is connected to the Sorry. Why yeah. shouldn't we use uh, P and Q in that question? Why are we miss our uh, distribution? Sorry, Q is from P, P and I. Uh, P and X and Y, y are samples from these distributions. So we, uh, we, should, we say that X is a set of samples which are generated from P, and Y is a set of samples which is generated from Q. And we define our P and Q through no. No, P is our data. Uh, okay. And so is our P data. is our data mm -hmm. and Q that we want to learn by training neural net is uh, so we don't have Q in some direct analytic form. We only have neural net that generates some samples and we want it to generate samples that will be in, from the same distribution. Uh. Is it okay that our loss is quadratic to this case of training examples? Yes. So can we do it like for data? Sorry? No. Could you repeat? Can we use it for data? With batch grading descent? So in experiments, in that step, I take a thousand of samples from data. Mm -hmm. Generate thousands mm -hmm. of samples from neural net, but actually I can uh, generate two thousands from neural net because uh, the uh, loss function doesn't depend on the equality of a number of samples in different batches. Okay, let us stop answering all questions now. The left one to continue. Okay. Mm -hmm. No. Okay, so another smart thing that we can do, and uh, well, uh, I believe you know that there are generative adversarial autoencoders, and actually, autoencoders were first used in the paper with MMD. So, the idea is that if we want a better quality, we, we can take our images. Train an autoencoder, so it is here in the rectangle. Uh, train an autoencoder and train our generative neural net to generate features of that autoencoder. So we will have a, a <coughs> lower dimensional space and uh, it is much denser uh, in terms of information and uh, it will be. As practice shows, uh, it is much more effective to uh, generate features instead of uh, plain images. Okay. That's pretty intuitional. And, uh, here are examples. So the first role is a simple MMD 
for NIST and faces. And the second one is MMT plus autoencoder, uh, also for, for NIST and faces. And as you can see, uh, simple MMT gives noisy uh, pictures, uh, but autoencoder one, MMT, gives more smooth. So I believe it is because we have a more dense uh, feature space, which maybe somehow um, describes curvature of digits, stuff like that. Excuse me. Uh, yeah. How can we uh, check that we don't overfit all of the data? How can we check that we don't overfit? That we not actually uh, remember each. Uh, but, mm, well, I can't really imagine how the neural net will uh, remember pictures because it doesn't have any pictures as input. It generates some random samples and it has uh, a, a oracle, which is a law of function, which says how good are generated samples. Maybe after training, uh, your neural network uh, generates only from a uh, finite uh, set of possible. Well, can, well, can you encode an image to get its code representation? Uh, then just take two images and interpolate between them and see whether the interpolation is smooth. If it is, then you can actually say blur, because obviously you don't have the whole interpolation in your training set. Well, I can't really uh, remember any case of overfitting my practice. Currently, I don't have examples of overfitting here, unfortunately. Sorry. Uh, can you ask a question about six slide? Mm -hmm. Next one. Uh, can we use any other neural net um, instead of GM, M, and neural net? Be uh, because that, maybe that it is a good baseline problem. for us. I can't understand why why should we use, uh, especially it uh, architecture there. Uh, so GM and MM is uh, just a generative moment matching network. Okay, can, can we use a fit forward net, for example? Yeah. Instead well, of fit forward net. Uh, fit forward uh, without, without so interesting loss, with only L2 loss, for example, and train it on, uh, out, uh, on, on what? On bottleneck of after encoder as uh, our label, for example. Why not? We, we can uh, approximate. Uh, so this is the neural net mm -hmm. that takes ah, okay. here we have input noise okay, and here we have features. Mm -hmm. So that is the neural net with MMD that okay, is okay. And has stupid only stupid. <coughs> no, it's not stupid. Just don't hesitate. It will be much better if you understand it. Okay. So the next Last question. Yeah. Uh, are there any problems mm -hmm. with? Uh, can the model learn to output always the same image, regardless of the noise? So, if your data is uh, that you're trying to generate, the training that the data is the most enough, I mean, does the MMT criteria check it just like this? Oh, so well, that's a good question. Yeah. That's a good question, and in the second part of the talk, we will have uh, uh, another connection which uh, clarifies why it doesn't uh, MMD learn to generate one image, for instance. Okay, so these are results, and uh, actually, we can compare it with adversarial auto encoders, and adversarial auto encoders are better in terms of visual quality. For instance, uh, you can mm -hmm. look at these faces, and these faces are more contrast and realistic. So in terms of quality, uh, the adversarial autoencoders are better. Okay. Better than this MMD minimizer. Yeah. Okay.
Okay. The next thing, now uh, the first part. Uh, yeah. Let me uh, compare in the minimize your release. As I said on the networks, uh, how do we choose parameters of how we come out to MMD minimizer? Like, oh, do they choose it somehow or simply yeah. like, fix it? Okay. Uh, that's <laughs> one question that you asked, but for what? About that square time. Mm -hmm. Actually, it can be not square, but linear, for instance. There are uh, at least three papers that uh, approximate that MMD function with uh, good quality and uh, one step can be made in linear uh, linear time instead of project. Okay, it wasn't my question. It was your question. It was my question right now. Yeah, right now, yes, but before. Okay, uh, the second question is... Okay. Uh, how do we choose parameters of our terminal? Okay, uh, well, in papers and in my uh, experiments with unconditional generating generation, uh, I use Gaussian and uh, research to find sigma of Gaussian. But there are some heuristics to fix Gaussian of sigma and don't search for it. Mm -hmm. uh, Nick Pedroich said earlier that if we like add to this MMD some uh, new neural network which will uh, produce these parameters in the way that no, uh, no. So, I understand. Uh, but maybe because of this, understand that it works better. Well, Not because yeah, of the yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, that's why I actually believe that adversarial networks are more powerful because they train their kernel, which is a discriminating neural net, just in time when generator runs. Uh, ah, so, uh, okay. Yeah, there is actually a problem with uh, generating models. Uh, then yeah, there is no really cool metric, and uh, visual uh, quality is not a uh, really metric. And uh, of window estimation is it's better not to use it. And actually, there are no good metrics for generation of images that I know now. So what did you use for the uh, Well, yes, we're running out of schedule. We have uh, approximately the same amount of material. Yeah. yeah. So let us try to limit ourselves with questions and ask okay. only extremely important questions. <laughs> okay. So the second part is that uh, given training data set, we'd like to learn to generate samples from posterior distribution. So our neural net will now get its input not only random noise Z, but also uh, X. And it will output samples Y. So here's an example. Uh, we have a task, given depth image of a hand, we'd like to predict uh, its structure, so uh, the points of on fingers. And uh, we have some convolutional plus polling layers, we get features, uh, we concatenate that features with some random noise, and after that, <coughs> Uh, after dense layers, we get some uh, samples of Y's. So these are hypotheses uh, where uh, points on fingers are uh, positioned. Okay. Is it clear? Okay. So uh, <clears throat> now we will need a different loss function because now we have. Uh, y is input, and uh, loss function has to match con conditional distributions. 
for any input x. So let's construct our loss function. Uh, we have two dis posterior distribution, and we have some distribution of samples of our neural net. And we have some task-specific loss function. For instance, in that case, the loss function is a, a mean squared arrow between uh, points in the samples from a neural net and uh, between ground truth. Okay, so for example, delta is L2, uh, L2 distance. And we will define coefficient, which is a, a I believe, divergence or so stuff like that. Uh, so we generate samples from our distributions, true and distribution of neural net. We generate x. After that, we compare uh, samples that we got, and we take expectations expectation on top of that. Okay? So then we will uh, <coughs> define the similarity coefficient between these two distributions. It will be a coefficient between true and generated distribution minus some affine composition of uh, generative and true distributions. Okay, so uh, actually this one is constant because we have some fixed training data and <coughs> we uh, forget that we use batch gradient descent and don't care about, about it. So our actual loss function will be that loss function. So what does it, what does that loss function mean? We want our neural net to, to generate samples very similar to our real data. So it is that. But we also want our neural net to generate diverse samples. And it is that part. So we try to, 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 to minimize or to maximize it? Um, minimize. 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 And so what do we penalize by the second term? The situation when uh, the variance of PG is zero. Yeah, right. we don't want to learn that function. Mm -hmm. For example, we could imagine that we, we have learned uh, the delta function at the conditional mode. Then it would be everything okay with the, with the first term. Yes. But the second term would be okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. So if we said, uh, well, gamma is uh, from 0 to 1, and it is some comprom compromise between diversity and accuracy. And uh, if we set gamma to 0, then we just get delta functions. Okay. Uh, then we will need uh, some estimates of these terms from uh, generated and real data. So the term for difference of true and generated distribution is empirical estimate of uh, expectation. So G is our neural net. It takes as input some random noise and X. It outputs some sample Y and it is compared with true sample Y. And for any pair Xn and Yn, we generate a number of samples Y and compare all of them with the same Yn. So, second, uh, what are generated samples here? Uh, the generated so, y's. 
what is going on. So for any training instance, we generate some k number of samples and compare each sample with the same yn. Uh, what does it mean we generate k samples? If we generate k samples, then probably the k is a synthetic sample. Yes. Uh, the noise. The is the noise. Okay, so uh, the sample is, is G of the K XM. Yeah, that uh, G is here for function mm -hmm. that is computed by neural net. Good. Okay. Uh, and the second term is diversity of generated samples. So for every, every training pair, we take XN and push it through a uh, neural net with different noises. After that, we compare all that uh, samples for fixed XN and uh, well, uh, this, uh, equal to, uh, this equation means that for every XN we will uh, generate diverse samples. Okay, is it clear? Okay, so we I haven't talked about delta function. I have mentioned that it's L2 and actually if we take gamma equal one half and as our task specific loss L2 norm. But then we have such uh, <coughs> equation, and there is another paper which shows that f if is minimized if and only if our uh, probability distributions are equal. In case of gamma one half and the uh, yes. delta function is also known. Yes. Okay. Why is that? Mm -hmm. Well, you can see that here I took out the summation on n. It is the summation on training samples. And in the brackets, well, actually, if you see, or uh, if you uh, <coughs> compare it with MMD, it will be the same as MMD, but without uh, the third term. So let's go up. So, here is our MMD. We say that this is constant and take only these two. Mm -hmm. And if we say that our K is L2 mm -hmm. difference, mm -hmm. then we obtain the same function. So that is MMD for training samples. <coughs> so for every training sample, and labeling, we generate a batch of samples and compare that batch of samples with one labeling using MMT. Well, that is here. But there is uh, one thing. Actually, this function is not a positive definite mm -hmm. kernel. It is a conditionally positive definite kernel, which is a vital case. But uh, <coughs> The rule for MMD doesn't work here, but uh, fortunately we have a paper which shows that for that particular case of conditionally uh, positive definite kernel, that will hold true. Yeah. So basically we can ditch MMD and just use L2 between two images in the previous like, approach. And nothing will change. Yes. So. Well, if you take another symmetric uh, non-negative function, it won't maybe uh, hold. Is there a practical difference? Sorry? Practical difference between using MD and, I mean, Gaussian well, kernel and L2 norm. Well, uh, the delta here is a function for our task. So for generating images, uh, Gaussian box and for generating samples of hand 
So off-labeling of hands works out for the instance. Maybe it's not about sure. Gaussian if you, if you apply it. I didn't try it. Okay, so the problem with that loss function, uh, which is uh, good for training samples and training for posterior, posterior prediction, uh, the problem is that we have only some partial, uh, some very tight case of L2 distance and that coefficient. But the main thing is the L2 distance. Uh, if you can apply L2 distance in your task, then you can successfully learn neural net uh, with that loss function, and it is guaranteed theoretically to uh, have minimum if and only if the, that thing is true. Okay, what's next? Oh, okay, so the next is uh, practical results. Uh, do you have any questions about how that loss function works? Okay, no questions. Okay, so here are practical results. This is a list of uh, quality metrics. These are different metrics. Uh, mean L2 distance between all points in our hand labeling, mass or L2 distance, and, and other two things doesn't that much. You get uh, outputs uh, several samples, and to get the best one, we will take uh, them all and compare. So, actually, we will uh, minimize task-specific loss, which we uh, estimate on the same samples from the neural net. Just the mean or over y if you use your loss function. So, uh, yeah, in the case yeah. of loss, this, uh, this is that. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> that that but if we have some other task specific loss, that's for example, L1, then it yeah. would be what? This is pretty clear. Okay, so these are results of experiments. Let's look at that one. So the base neural net is a neural net where gamma is set to zero. So that is deterministic neural net with which uh, trains to predict uh, some uh, y given x. So it can potentially learn to ignore random noise. Why? Why gamma equal to zero? I mean, gamma was... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> gamma is efficient responsible for okay, the possibility. So, if we throw away the possibility, then we yeah. get diversity of only true and generative. And we can prove that in this case the optimal answer is yes. to predict the conditional mode. Yes. The most mm -hmm. probable value of one. Actually, we get deterministic neural net. Mm -hmm. So the baseline is deterministic neural net with some additional parameters. And uh, the point here is that uh, DISCO, which is uh, a true uh, probabilistic, uh, true generative neural net, uh, it shows better results using that uh, type of prediction than the deterministic one. So training our neural net to generate samples can actually uh, give better quality. If, uh, so we add diversity of samples, and, uh, that helps to get better quality. So here is a, a 
comparison with conditional guns. And uh, here are two modes. The conditional gun trained from scratch and a uh, conditional gun uh, convolutional layers of which are of discriminator and generator are uh, initialized from disconnect and uh, fixed. And only fully connected layers are trained. Fully connected where? In discriminator? In discriminator and in uh, generator. So uh, authors got problem that uh, conditional gun trained from scratch uh, with the same architecture of uh, generating discriminator as disconnect gets <coughs> bad results. And if they pre initialized it from disconnect and uh, trained only on the fully connected place, then it also got bad results. So it appears that the results are becoming worse. Yes. How can that happen? Well, uh, they try to fix architecture and uh, to, 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 to make a honest uh, to make a honest comparison with disconnect. Uh, they try to learn the same architecture, and uh, they usually got uh, the picture that uh, Sigan uh, diverged. Why didn't they use the architecture from Sigan? Uh, I don't know the, the precise architecture, but Must be. Uh, I'm, I'm a city. If I read the paper, I raise a couple of questions about the fairness of these comparisons. Mm -hmm. so because, um, maybe it is better to read paper and uh, supplementary material so they uh, describe how they try to make an honest comparison to come. Okay, and uh, that part is they uh, compare with state of the art. And uh, unfortunately, they so here is a blue line here, and the pink line is best. And they don't get state of art. Okay, so but nevertheless, they were accepted to the leaps. Yeah. Uh, so what what was the point of all that stuff? There. Uh, the best thing with a uh, generative neural net uh, compared to the deterministic one is that it can obtain <coughs> probability and samples, stuff like that. So here are input depth maps, and uh, gray is ground truth, and in the red color uh, are a number of samples. So if you see something blurry, then samples don't overlap precisely, and then there is a uh, uncertainty in the position of fingers. So, uh, for instance, here finger isn't seen very clearly. Then uh, the uncertainty on the <laughs> finger is, and here all parts of fingers are pretty strict, and uh, uncertainty on the fingertips is larger. So uh, all the point of training generative neural net for a stereo prediction is to get uh, such estimations on uncertainty. But the, uh, the hard thing is to find really uh, good tasks for evaluating such model, because not in every task such uncertainty is very useful. Okay, so here is a summary. So MMD is very theoretically grounded loss uh, for training generative models, and uh, it is simpler to implement, simpler to train. So authors in their paper complained that training SIGANS uh, was hard. And uh, actually, MMD is also faster to train than SIGANS, 
because uh, you don't have to train discriminator. Can you please explain it better? Yeah. The end of this first and then this divergence. What was the connection? Well, uh, the point is that uh, seagulls are tricky to uh, train. Uh, yeah. So we started with the end and then you touched to another topic. Yeah. What was the, the connection between them? Oh, the connection is that in some sense, it's in some sense uh, that term is the same as MMD, but it is not proved that these uh, conditionally positive definite kernel, kernel uh, is okay for MMD. So, uh, for positive definite kernel, uh, MMD works, and for L2, uh, no, for conditional positive, it is not proved. Is a future. It's a uh, future direction for research. I don't get how it can be called a kernel in any sense, conditional or not, if it's zero on equal arguments. Okay. So actually, uh, the kernel uh, must be not L2, but. minus L2. So, so this is like negatively yeah. infinite, uh, next to infinite schedule. Sorry? You still have zero. Okay. <laughs> so that's what's the problem. Well, the, the, the problem is that there are some doubts that this is a uh, positive definite kernel, or at least conditionally positive. It is conditionally positive definite kernel, and I can uh, point you to the Okay, can you, can you please uh, first ask what is conditionally positive definite kernel? Okay. I, I do not understand this term. So, <laughs> positive definite kernel is that. Uh, X I X J. And additional positive definite kernel is that thing with that's additional positive ah, definite kernel. That's it. Yeah. Who could think? It was not pretty clear from the definition from, from, from the name of this conditional mm -hmm. positive. Uh, okay, let us let us uh, get back to this L2. No. Why is it conditionally at positive <laughs> I will not prove it. <laughs> so I can point you to a paper by Shawcrow, uh, 2002, where he shows that minus L2 distance is a conditionally positive definite kernel. Uh, <laughs> who could guess? Ten. And where are uh, conditions here? <laughs> that conditions that you have uh, pointed us out. Well, the no, thing is that the conditionally Definite kernel for that uh, paper here first, uh, one for 2007. Okay, so that guy uh, minus L2 is not positive definite kernel. Mm -hmm. So LMD doesn't work for that. Mm -hmm. But there is another paper that states that loss function of that. Uh, so that loss function precise loss, loss function is, uh, is minimized if and only if these are uh, equal distributions. But there is a connection between <coughs> this and M and D if you take minus L2 as kernel. Okay. So the future direction is to investigate if uh, conditionally positive definite kernels work for also work for MMD, and it's it's not proof now. 
Okay, and as I said, uh, we have L2 or minus L2 kernel, and if you want to generalize that loss function on other tasks which don't have um, L2 as task specific loss function, then we have to investigate uh, if uh, if that thing will hold. So and to do this, you, you first need to investigate the, the sketch of the proof of this theorem 5. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, so that's all. I have a question about um, what is better, MMD or GANs? Because it's not clear for me. Because in the first part, uh, we saw experiments that GANs is much better. Uh, and then the server auto encoders, not GANs. Uh, yeah, that's sort of, uh, but that's okay. a bit different. Model thing. which uses as a part MMD or GAN, and this this model with GAN work better. Yeah. Yes? Well, right? Uh, in terms of visual quality, yeah. Okay. So and in the second part <coughs> we saw like this table with experiments there I didn't understand what is C GAN. C GAN uh, is conditional GAN. Okay, but they, uh, they like usual uh, implementation from authors, they yes. simply uh, did something and it didn't work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, they tried to make it, train it for bad results, but. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually, the the point. Point. this is not the They had the problems, problems with GAN, and yeah, the MMT, they, uh, out of box, don't have such problems. So you don't know, maybe in some different uh, <coughs> tasks, uh, some guys try to use MMD and GAN and compare it somehow. No? Do you, do you know about this? Maybe authors don't uh, know how to train GANs properly. Also <laughs> so, so what is better? There is no answer for this question. Yeah. Like, okay. It should, so should find its own answer. It is okay. just an alternative with different properties and um, some other classes and also minus. I mean, it was strange that in the first part MMD was like uh, auto encoder, auto encoder with MMD was uh, uh, not so good as yeah. auto encoder as gun, but in the second part you saw like these numbers, the uh, C guns are much, much worse than MMDs. Because in the first part they use not their results on guns, but from but paper. But usual results, <laughs> like not usual. Uh, from us, it, it because like that is a <laughs> problem. And here the problem was a bit different. So maybe so guns are good, it. but they don't know how to train them. Okay. Yeah, this is yeah. Okay. That's the same the thing I said. Yes. Okay. Okay, any more questions? Uh, if there are no questions, uh, let me conclude with a couple of remarks. Uh, so this is already the um, second talk, like the previous one by Dwight Heath, where um, we can see their neural networks that take, that take random noise as input and generate sounds reasonable as output. So this is quite interesting and probably you should uh, pay attention to such kind of models. So uh, traditional neural networks uh, were used uh, as follows. They took something reasonable as input and tried to predict some hidden value of the objects uh, whose observed variables uh, they took as input. And here's the, the paradigm is completely different. We take random noise and we try to modify random noise to produce something random, but still reasonable. So uh, neural networks are used for, for some nonlinear uh, sequential transformation of uh, uh, random variables. That's interesting, and probably this is uh, quite fruitful uh, since already this is already the second time where we, we, we meet uh, this paradigm, and probably uh, much more uh, variables to come. Uh, that, uh, that will be using the, 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 the same idea of generating something, something reasonable from, from random noise. So now let us uh, thank the speaker. And our next speaker in the video will be uh, Vladimir Smolin, who is absent today.